Hello everyone at NFP, welcome to the Trans Masterclass with Joseph Harwood. Obviously, the clues in the title, I'm joined by the lovely Joseph Harwood. How are you? Hi, I'm okay, thank you. I'm really excited to do this because I haven't done a proper tutorial since I think I moved off of my YouTube career, so I was very honoured to be asked. So, right, we're glad we're glad you're here. We're glad you, you're, you're here with us today. So, firstly, what we're going to do for you guys, we're just going to show you the 10 minute masterclass that we have with Joseph Harwood. Hi, everyone, it's me, Jojo, and today I'm bringing you a classic boy to girl tutorial from back in the day on YouTube. This has been my signature, and I was fortunate enough to win a psycho reality competition with it several years ago. And for me, I don't think of myself as either boy or girl, it was just a buzzword to get people invested. And then I could show them how I do a masculine version of myself and then a feminine version of myself, when in fact, really, I'm a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> so my basis to doing all of this is to start off with the structure of the face. So for this masculine look, what I'm doing is applying a color that replicates shadow. This is going to be on top of the cheekbone because in male secondary sexual characteristics, things that we develop through puberty, our structure and fat pads change. So if you are masculine presenting and this is the kind of look for you, if you ever need some little techniques, please take what you want. For me, I tend to go either a little bit paler than my skin tone or I go a little bit darker than my skin tone, depending on what vibe I'm giving with the makeup. Um, for a masculine look, the rare times I do it, and I'm doing it in lockdown a little bit because I haven't had access to laser hair removal, um, but I tend to go a little bit darker because my neck's darker than my face. And to me, it kind of distinguishes between the two. So I use a brush that I can really buff the product in the skin. And this is a product actually by It Cosmetics. And I'll give you full breakdowns in the description below in this masterclass. So as you can see, I'm using it more so to set the tone of the face. It's not that different from my neck, but my actual face is a bit lighter because I never let it touch the sun. And now I'm going in with Kevin Aquan Sensual Skin Enhancing um, Concealer. This is an amazing product. It really, but it really buffs in the skin. But as you can see, it covers any flaws. So if anyone has any acne, this is the one you go in before, and you cover any blemish. Now I've set this through with Dermacolor, and I'm using a product by Mac called the Studio Skin Finish in their mineralize product. So it gives you more of a glow than just a simple set. Now taking a color that's more close to my natural skin tone, I'm sculpting in the face. This will basically construct different shapes and shadows in your skin and your face. To me, I widen the bridge of my nose, so I make the top of my nose wider and I make the whole bulk of my nose seem straight. So for me, when I want to actually create a perfect canvas for the face, I don't want you to see the distinguishable lines. I want to give basically a seamless blend throughout. Now I'm going in with the eyebrows and my eyebrows grow quite, they're quite, they're quite feminine in shape. They're higher up than you'd imagine um, for someone that was cis male. And thankfully that allows me to be myself. So that's great. I'm using a build up of a liner by MAC, which gives a sort of soft but defined hair stroke against that sort of browning hair stroke of the coal pencil by Huda. And now I'm going in with some actual blush and some bronze to really buff into the skin. This will give some color in the areas around the temple and with secondary sexual characteristics in guys, you tend to have more brow ridging. This is something that grows through puberty. I don't have that brow ridging. So for me, I actually have to construct it with a deeper shade. Now I'm going in and just making sure all of those colors blend in together. And I think that with male hairlines, they tend to be a little bit more square. For me, I've got one side of my face that's square and the other side of my hairline is actually more round. So the one that's a little bit rounder, I tend to actually ignore. And then on this side, I just enhance the squareness of the shape. I take an eyeshadow that's matte in the same color as my sort of hair and my roots at the moment, which are sort of this mousy brown. And then I go in. Now to really enhance the cheekbone shape and give me that sort of chiseled sort of masculine sort of structure I will go in with some baking which I just do under the cheekbone and I've done this new technique which actually involves using face paint um I've tried using a wire sponge which is a theatrical sponge to recreate the effect of facial hair and often with oil products or cream products they grab they don't look as natural so face paint's been the only one that I think looks great 
Now I'm just going to clean up my lashes with some brown mascara just to give some volume and some definition and then I go back in and think mm, can I improve on this can I make this a little bit more to my sort of HD rendition and every time I do makeup my reference points come from video games so I always want to look like I'm rendered from a video game when I kind of look like that that's when I give myself a nod or an approval. I'm using a Shiseido product on the lips and I really, really enjoyed this product because it looks so natural. It just sort of airbrushes your lips. Um, I have quite big lips, but they're real. So I have to do a little bit more cautionary lip application. But here we go. <laughs> So for the girl look and my female presenting look, I use a shaver by Estrid. It's a really gorgeous product. I also use a couple of skincare. One is by Exuviance. It gets rid of any um, blemishes from shaving your face. And one is just an antibacterial spray. On the back of my hand, I've mixed in some peachy red into a concealer. And as you can see, it looks orange without it being neon. You never want to go that intense with this type of skin colour um, because it will just show through the foundation. The deeper your skin tone, the more deeper the colour should be in your colour correction. Now I've applied all over my face the same product as before but this time it's in a lighter colour because I'm not going to be cutting into the face, I'm going to be sculpting. It's kind of like a backwards thing. And with women's faces, because in secondary sexual characteristics when we assess the face, there's more fat distribution in the cheeks, so things are rounder. I'm using less contouring and more blush to sort of reveal the apple of the cheek that I naturally have and this is the look I feel more confident in. Now with my facial hair, because my facial hair grows like the hide of a badger and it grows back every single Christmas, it's like I have a winter facial hair that just comes through and in the summer I have very little hair. Um, I haven't been able to access laser hair removal in lockdown so it's been really, really, really um, dysphoric for me. But I tend to use a sponge to lay down the powder on top of my facial hair areas so it just smooths down. Don't buff in areas that you are concerned about facial hair. With the structure of the eyes, I'm not really doing an eyeshadow look. I'm really trying to define my eyelids. So I'm not giving anyone a blueprint of what looks male and what looks female. I'm exaggerating the space and the shadows so that for me, when I do one or the other look, I can feel like I have a complete difference. Um, for me, it's just elongating and drawing out the eyes so they look more feline. And instead of actually narrowing the bridge, I'm using my actual bridge shape as the guide. So my nose is a bit thinner and instead of actually defining super thick brows, I'm using that soft pen actually just to colour in the brows. So any areas that I have sparse growth or I think that I need a little bit more fullness, I'm using more of a defined thinner style. So I always cut back in with a concealer. Um, I think it's really important to just keep on correcting anything you feel uncomfortable about and make sure that this is a process that you can feel confident in. I'm using a brown liner on top of the actual um, lashes just to smoke out and I'm using the same product I used by Shiseido on the lips. Instead of actually going inside my lip line, I go on the edge of my lip line where I have more of a voluminous um, depression. This looks a bit funny when I'm in close up, but actually when you take a step back and you're in real life, you can't distinguish the lip line because I have a projected lip line. I wanted to disguise this a little bit further by using some matte eyeshadow in a similar colour and obviously with all of the contouring you want it to look bright, glowy and almost full of volume. So I'm smudging everything out and I'm keeping the lines as soft as possible because the thing is in 2021 because we've got so much wonderful representation in the LGBT community and outside of that who play with gender, play with image and play with makeup. A lot of what we see in makeup is well-known drag techniques. Now, this is very different from drag techniques. This is about confidence building and creating a foundation for whatever creativity you want to apply on top. For me, I feel most secure when I feel like myself, and this is the blueprint that I use. I really hope you've enjoyed this mini masterclass and check out all my work, which is under official name, Joseph Harwood, but you guys can call me Jojo. Send in love to Student Pride. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on this channel, and I can't wait to share more with you today. Love, love, love. Okay, so that was my makeup tutorial. And basically what I wanted to share with everyone today is part of my toolkit in my experience. Um, I joined YouTube when I was about 15, 16 on a collaboration channel that was orientated around trans people. And I was living every day female presenting. And I could not get into the access point of the same sponsorship as many of my peers on YouTube. They still were not ready to bring LGBT people into the forefront. 
So when I created the concept of the boy to girl tutorial, it wasn't because I had defined what a boy looked like and it wasn't what I defined what a girl looked like. It was in my life, I had to split myself in two. I had to do a boyish look, which I did around certain events in my family, obviously with the expectations of what you've got to be like around um, certain households in your family, I guess, and then who I was in my real life. So I created that video with the intention of helping people during transition so people that wanted to learn how to add extra beard if they were growing their beard or if someone wanted to soften their faces because the hormones were taking a little bit of time to set in. It was not to describe what boy and girl is, but to help people that just wanted that assistance. So in this era of YouTube and social media, we've built on the foundations, I think, of my generation. And we all spoke about this stuff in 2007, 8, 9 and 10. And um, we started collaboration channels in 2012 and 13, which were orientated around trans and non-binary people. And this generation in 2021, we now have understood a lot of the stuff we've already discussed. So people are playing with gender in a much more diverse way. And there are no rules. I do not believe in rules. And everyone's identity is important and valid. So that's my version of it from back in the day. And here we are. Perfect. I think it, it segues perfectly into some questions I have for you, Joe. So you've obviously been killing it for so long now on YouTube, outside of YouTube, <laughs> uh, with your own businesses and stuff. How did it all start? How did you how did you get into it? Well, it was before social media, really. Well, it kind of was and wasn't because I was on MySpace when I was at school. So I wanted to meet LGBT people. I'm currently in my granddad's house which he built in the 60s. And when he passed away, we came as a family and organized a way of keeping it. So I think that was probably my biggest accomplishment in my YouTube career, I think, um, because it's the symbol of where I started and now I've become successful, I can help people do that. But I I couldn't find anyone like me and I was unrelentlessly like myself. I was wearing crazy wear, hair wear and all this manner of stuff to school with skinny jeans and full face geisha makeup and looked like a doll. So I went onto MySpace and when I was on MySpace, I was scouted as a model by the editor of Face Confused magazine. And at 14 and 15, I started to cast for things like Alexander McQueen. And by this time I was 17, I was being booked to work in Tokyo. So I went to Tokyo the going from 2018 into 2019 and I was there as a model and then I came back in 2019 and I wanted to become a makeup artist because when I was in Tokyo the photographers were like you're amazing at makeup why are you not doing the makeup and you're making your life so difficult because I was presenting as a girl and they were not it, it, there were so many events that I could describe when I was modeling where people just weren't ready for a, someone like me a lot of times people thought I was a cisgender girl from my photos and I'd be booked on the photos and I'd be dropped last minute because they thought I was a cis girl. Um, so I consciously made my name Joe Gaparwood instead of Joe, because everyone could say Joe or Joe Joe. And I wanted it not to be, I wanted to clear the space without me having to explain myself. And um, mm. so I took the name Joe Gaparwood, which is a family name and my masculine presenting name, even though it's not what I call myself or my friends do, it was my little moniker. And it cleared up the space. And from then, I started to do YouTube, and YouTube became very successful for me. And I guess that's how it all began. If you could go back to that time, would you change anything or do anything differently? Yeah, I, I definitely would, because I had so much dysphoria. And, and I, it's, I think if I, if I could be me today in guiding myself at that age, I would have made so much more progress. I know it sounds ridiculous because everyone's like, oh my God, you've got done so well with your stuff. But I feel like I could have reached gigantic heights had I had the right nurturing. I think people could have given me um, just a little bit more guidance when it came to the business of stuff because I was doing a lot of stuff, but it, it was only till 2013 and 14 that I actually started making money from this. I didn't make any money as a makeup artist. I didn't make any money as a model. Um, and I wanted... I think when you get that access to money, you can change everything. I know it sounds ridiculous to say this, mm. but the most important thing I think for our community is to finance things and to collaborate in financial projects because once you get those bills paid and you get the basics done and you can actually actively sort out your cause of dysphoria, whether it's part of your transition or it's something that you go through in a, your unique journey, and um, it helps to have a little extra. and. I, I wish that someone could have just helped me figure out how to be more business-minded earlier because I would have skipped a lot of mistakes I made um, in 2014 and 15, I guess. I've seen from a lot of 
um, my own trans friends, like, and their own journeys, where it's a lot of case of, if the money's there, it's it's a, it's a lot easier to deal with. It's, it shouldn't be, because we should have access to everything as part of our health system. Just... And for me, I always go back to the point of view that we need to educate people on, on the health side of things before we talk about the social side of things, because it's the 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 undiagnosed symptoms of gender dysphoria that people go through like i was going through pseudo menstrual cramps which i've never had any trans person go through um, and talk about and i didn't know i was chemically intersex until much later in my life i had to actually go to a doctor and find this information out for myself but i didn't have the same composure and and um chemical composition as as a cis guy that became a woman or anything like that, I naturally transitioned. My body was just going through that anyway. Mm. And no one would talk to me about this. And the doctors I went to see were basically ignoring me. And it made me feel like I had to control every element of my life. I had to be so in control of my image, so in control of things. I had to make myself look perfect in every image. And it, that's not the best way to deal with things. Like you, I think that we need to talk about the support systems that we need to put in place for people that go through that so they don't have self-damaging and tactics, which I think I did. That's the bit that I wanted to help my younger self out with. I think there were so many things that I just didn't know. And you have to go through a process of falling and picking yourself back up. And I, I've come to a conclusion in my life that whatever I am, I'm just a soul that's wearing a body. And if I can impersonate a Leo or Marilyn Monroe on my YouTube tutorials, I can impersonate different gender expressions just to make my life a little bit more simpler. Yeah, 100%. And it's something that you, you said to me before where I've asked you about um, your transness is you don't mind what pronouns people use as long as they use a smile with it. And that really resonated with me in my own journey. It's like, I know that I present male and I, I look male and all that stuff. But for me, it's not something that is always something that I always feel comfortable in. So it's like, I don't mind as long as you're nice to me. And you're not an ass. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> That's so, right. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think there's a message in that that I was taught very young, which was, can you read what someone's intention is? I mean, you've got to remember, like, we live in such a, a quick, short attention span type of world with social media. And, and the conversations surrounding trans um, language and the way we describe things is defined by young people who have no experience of physical aggression in the extreme way that people 20 years did. I mean, we've just watched It's the and we've spoken about, like, I don't know, the HIV crisis that happened. And during that time period, if you were trans, the, the difference in your life compared to today was extreme. So I don't want to discount the women that walk through that and say, you're using the T-R-A-N-N-Y words. Therefore, you should be cancelled. Like that is absurd. That's being defined by a young person. Now, sometimes a young person has got all of the brilliance and wisdom that an old person has, but we do need to respect what's happened before us. And the thing that I've taken from all of the older trans people in my life is we've been through shit that was not easy. And I know if someone is being purposely horrific or if they're actually coming from a place of just ignorance and not knowing better. And I want to give people the space to make a mistake because then I can help them correct them and we need to get people's addresses and, and means of address and pronouns correct. But if someone does make the mistake because they're not meaning to, it's not a, it shouldn't feel as painful as someone that's deliberately misgendering you. They're two different things. And yeah. I think sometimes the younger generation confuses that. And it's all about understanding and using your discernment to figure out intention. And um, that is a skill. You have to learn discernment and intention. It's it's the way that we, it's a different form of language. People do need to be able to learn and have those mistakes. Like if, if you don't make these mistakes, how are you gonna learn? There's no one there to teach you. Like this is why I think cancel culture is such a negative thing because no one's, no everyone's being like persecuted for a mistake instead of taught different and taught the right way. People cannot take it that seriously when someone's saying this is an old school word and this is a new school word. You can't take comments like that as being derogatory. There, if someone's saying it to you with a fist, that's kind of a key that they're meaning it in a nasty way. Mm. Or if someone's demeaning you, that's that's a nasty thing to do. But if someone's talking about history, we can't ignore 
hideous acts by denying the language that we used amongst them. So we need to educate ourselves on where we come from so we know not to step up when mistakes or um, or things that have targeted us. Do you think that's what has inspired you to be where you are today? Um, I I think because I, I never got um, medical support until I could finance it myself. I never got um, counselling for abusive situations I've been through. I never received any special treatment in careers. I was told consistently throughout my um, career as a makeup artist, it, this is the job to position in my life. Simon Cowell wanted to find the world's best makeup artist. And at the same time, Essay Lauder counters were telling me my image was wrong and I couldn't work in a makeup counter. So that was the extreme polarity within my life. It's always been every single time I've done something incredible and something successful, there's also been this real lived experience that I don't talk about on social media that really um, damaged my self esteem, I think, around certain things. I mean, you build new damages. It's like a constant thing with, with your self of sense. Your sense of self worth, you always have to keep on working towards becoming more confident and more grounded in who you are. And knowing things like that are silly, like knowing things like being judged on your appearance in a retail job is silly because mm. I wasn't, I was just naturally androgynous. I wasn't going there in cyber goth makeup or something. I was there to be myself and to sell makeup. And they were telling me profoundly, your image won't fit. And this is not just one counter, this is several. Um, and then I think when I speak to younger non-binary or trans people, um, I don't want them to go through the same trauma I went through. I really, it's more about that. I really don't want younger people to go through that. I, I can't stand it. It's my motivating factor. And when when I used to do the collaboration channels, there was no people of color on the on the collaboration channels. It was predominantly white. Mm. Um, and I just thought this is so weird. Why are people not like thinking about this stuff? Like, so when I did my own collaboration channel, I was fighting to get all LGBT people of colour and, and non-binary people. And they were like, oh, well, this is drag and this isn't trans. And I was like, well, who the fuck cares? We're all going to be gay bashed on the same person at the end of the day. Mm. Who cares? So it's, it's really about that. And, and my motivation is always about lifting people up. I don't want to be successful on my own. I want us all to be in like the Power Rangers together and, and to <laughs> kill. <laughs> you mentioned um, being vegan and stuff. Has, um, has that made it harder to shop for makeup? And just in general, I found it difficult just being vegetarian. Um, but I can only imagine how difficult it is vegan. Vegan makeup, I think there's lots of access points for vegan makeup. But as we've just seen in Seaspiracy, whatever it's called, um, they are licensing these labels um, to make people think they're vegan, but they're not actually vegan sometimes. I mean, the biggest thing for me is to make sure you're not poisoning yourself with things that are dodgy. And, and if the packaging can be recycled, I think that's the moment we need to move into. But no, it was always natural for me to be vegan because I couldn't eat meat. I, it, I was fed in a carnivorous family that eat like the red big slab of meat and I couldn't eat it as a baby. So I had to grow up and learn how to cook for myself. And it was not, it was not normal for my family to have someone that didn't eat meat. I was the odd sheep <laughs> even then. <laughs> so no, it, but it's, it's important. And I think that it's, it's good to be aware of things like veganism. But do whatever you want. And it's moving into that. Like I did the Veganuary campaign this year and I was really proud to be a trans person in that campaign. So I'm, I like giving people the option to learn instead of just saying, don't do this, don't do this. But I want people to look at my website, look at all the recipes and think, oh, that looks yummy. I want to try mm -hmm. that instead of, oh, I'm being shamed into doing something. I think it, it works better if you encourage. <laughs> um, what would you say your top makeup go-to is? Um, with makeup, I, I swap all the time because I always try and learn about new products. So I always think, oh, I go through like phases where I love something and I love something else. Um, I think the thing that makes me feel the best about myself is... Well, there's lots of things, really. I think it's just because I had acne when I was growing up and my hormones were over the place, I used to use foundations I used to, every single week. I go to um, school with crazy foundations, like things that you couldn't even imagine. Like, it would make a drag queen look like a Virgin Mary. Like, there was no thick grease paint to school just because I wanted to try it. And I, I used to use it without setting it, which was an incredible 
thing to do. There's a product called MAC called Full Coverage, which is actually their concealer in a big pot. And I used to wear it in a yellow, neon yellow NC15 colour with no setting. Just looking like a Simpsons character that's gone through a mudslide. It's just ridiculous. Um, but <laughs> I, I do like foundations. I think that now I'm more of a skincare junkie than I am um, foundations. I think I use loads of skincare to help my beard area because I have, um, well, I've got mixed heritage and I've been, I'm developed folliculitis from that mixed heritage. So when my beard grows back, it sometimes gets stuck under the surface of the skin and I get bumps, which make me feel really insecure. So I use products by a brand called Exuviant, which is a, I use a cleanser. And ever since I use that cleanser, which has an acid in it, it sheds the skin quicker. So you don't get that buildup under the skin and it transforms people's skin. So lots of people ask me about shaving and folliculitis and, and acne relating to um, skin problems in, through transition and so on. And I think that's something that I really want to look into with a new project I'm working on. What? tips would you give someone starting out to wear makeup to masculine masculinize or feminize their face um well if you wanted to help yourself during the process of transition because i guess that that would be what that would be for or if you were learning drag and wanted to have a starting point in drag yes you wanted to do that too whatever the reason um there's many reasons for wanting to do that um i would say that with with your face people always think you're going to paint on um, a picture on top of your face. Well, your face is 3D and you see yourself from a very specific angle. So you don't see yourself from the side, you don't see yourself in different lightings. My trick was always to use light to define where I place the shadow. So I'd hold like a lamp above my head or a torch or an iPhone torch above your head and it will show you where your highlights are. So if you think about how men and women change during puberty, you go through this process where se secondary sexual characteristics, which are things that are different between the blueprint of man and woman, they change. And um, your fat changes in your face if you're feminine. If you look at someone going through transition, they have more fat packs through their face. And also everything that's cartilage, like your nose, your ears, and around your brows, they grow stronger if you're a boy, if you're growing in, in, in that male pattern. Um, so I play up wherever I want. I will draw in that brow wedging and I will furrow my brows and use my face as a template. So instead of thinking, oh, I've got to look like Johnny Depp or whoever, or Idris Elba, whatever, I will look at my face and say, what would my face look like if I had more of a brow wedging? And then I draw it in. Mm -hmm. And then I use the face, instead of cutting into the contours of the face if I'm doing feminine, I will bring out those structures so they look more rounded and fuller. So I don't really use contour when I'm doing a feminine look. But use your face as a template always. And um, if you start copying other people's aesthetic, it's a good starting point, but you won't learn those magic moments when the makeup looks right on you. What advice would you give um, a young trans individual just starting to live their truth? Um, I think that I think that people need to be assured that there are safe spaces to talk. This is where I think people are drawn to the internet because they can use anonymity and they can use um, different profile pictures and things to share their thoughts and their inner feelings, which they must and have to do as people, but without the fear of being seen before they're ready to be seen. And I think that's very important, but I really wish we had more trans safe spaces and hopefully I will be working on that going forward but I think that you have to set up a space that you can psychologically be yourself but not necessarily use that in the same way as use the social media I think it's really it can be quite tricky to balance the two because you almost split yourself into two you split yourself into the person that you are inside and then you're using that sort of as an armor to create a platform online for yourself as well. Um, so you do a lot of work with inclusivity. Um, how do you, how do you, how can the world be more inclusive in general and further within um, the workplace or the education environment? I will always tell people in businesses and in brands, I just did something with the Princess Trust a couple of weeks ago where um, I spoke about you, you, we aren't seeing a lot of people in different roles. Why are we not seeing a trans person on dancing, on ice, or on 
a cooking show. There's none. There's none on. There's no TV normality. Like because that's what changes people's minds when they see someone, and they see they they identify someone trans as something normal. If the only identification that people have of trans people is on Good Morning Britain arguing with R.I.P. Piers Morgan, <laughs> I that's not going to give anyone um, any insight into the humanity that trans people have. Mm. Is it? It's, when people are eating their cornflakes in the morning and seeing a person fighting, the optics of that is not, you're not going to engage with it and think, oh, that's that person is decent and pays the same bills as me. We need to see that. We need to see people on this morning. And I'm so happy my friend Juno um, is in Hobby City and like normal TV shows in England because it's giving people actually a reference point to say this is normal. It, I, I was asked to go on all of these like strange documentaries in the UK from 2014 till 2021 about gender transforming. And as soon as I said to them, I'm thriving, there's no big horrific moment I want to talk about and telling I'm thriving. They didn't want to show that. Mm. They didn't want to show someone. They wanted to show people that were going through stigma or bullying or the, I can't remember what the, the gender quake. It was, they didn't want to show people thriving. And when when people can't see trans people thriving, they do not know. And sometimes they're saying, let's be inclusive, we're going to put a non-binary person in to speak about trans issues. And people think that a non-binary person with no medical experience of transition is trans. Mm. That All of this stuff is just, it's, it's not that it's wrong, it's that it's confusing people that don't know better. Um, going back to what you said about um, companies um, in your previous point, a lot of it is just the bare minimum. Like you're doing the bare minimum. Like where, where's like as you said, where's the equal pay for for trans people compared to cis people? Where mm-hmm. is the the same opportunity? There's like there's a lot that still needs to be done, and it's still just the bare minimum that only small amount of companies are doing. That's right. And I know a lot of charities like LGBT Foundation and um, I think there's a couple more are doing an almost like a, a award system, whether you've been inclusive and you offer counselling and support and things. But what I've seen has happened in even institutions like the police, where they are actively searching for people of colour to be new police people at the moment. Um, why would you want to be given a job because they want to fill a quota. It's got to be earned. You've got to be, you've got to feel like you've earned the same opportunity as someone else that's sick. And I think that people just don't know how to do that. I, th- I think they don't know how to do that. And I think the way to do that would be to, to just open the boundaries up to let everyone do anything. And they won't do that. Like I said, I, so many times I've said to people, I, the uh, Poos, you do Christian Louboutin and, Chabot Gautier, Charlotte Tilbury, they asked me to host 10 ateliers about inclusivity. So I went to Paris and Barcelona and I was speaking for hours at end with the managers and the company directors of all these crazy people. And they listened to me because they booked Violet Chachki for Jean Gautier and they did a non-binary um, pack of rabans. They did listen to me, but I had to say to them, like, when you're advertising an eye, eye makeup, how do you know whose genitalia is attached to this eye? You don't know what their gender is. It's an eye. You could choose anyone for that, but you're only looking for females to do that. Like, that's crazy. Like, I've got the biggest lashes of anyone I've ever met in my life. They're like camels. So I think I could do a good job at doing an eye campaign. Do you know what I mean? But they, it's like you're losing out on the before and after of that sales pitch, maybe a mascara campaign. Like, why not put someone with huge eyelashes in? I mean, like, hello. I think there are more but cis and men with big eyelashes. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. but things like that are not considered. I and mean, it's just pointing out the obvious. I'm like, would you not want to create that maximum before and after and think about it? Just opening up those doors will be, like, beneficial to you. I mean, it's not just all about just let's be inclusive for the sake of being inclusive. Let's actually shine a light on people that are brilliant and give those brilliant people the job support they need. Laurie and um, Charles is an amazing journalist. She's on Twitter and She's fantastic. She did so many breaking stories. I want to see her on the TV shows, given pundancy, because she's got an incredibly articulate voice. I love seeing people that are good be recognised for being good. Mm. Like, I don't just want to see anyone being put in 
for the sake of it. It needs to have some value to it. So I think we need to start doing that. 100%. Is there something that you really want to do? Like, what is your dream? Oh, my God, I want to do so much stuff. I, because I've got a big birthday coming up, I wanted to um, show I could do different types, like different genres of business. So I wanted to prove I could do like loads of different things, which I did, which I'm happy about. But I want to go into um, different performance stuff. That's what I really want to do. And I've never said this before in any interview or anything. I really want to do things. Like, I wanted to be like a voice of an animal, like in a cartoon. That'd be fun. Like, I'd love to do like a voiceover or something crazy. Obviously, not today in my husky tone, but I'd love to do something like that. That'd be so cool. Or I'd be, or I could design. I really want to do a children's cartoon. I would do an inclusive fun. children's cartoon. I want to do like the LGBT type of the pig. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to do something like that. Or I want to do like, um, I always want to create buildings. I love creating renovations and stuff, which is pretty fun. We've got an office building being built in France at the moment, which is really exciting because it's like um, the structure of those buildings are crazy and it's going to be amazing lighting, like an old school artist studio. And mm. um, I love doing things like that. I just, I always want to do more stuff. And when I originally like had this vision in my head of all the things I wanted to do, I really wanted to do fashion. I wanted to do fashion design. And I originally got into the fashion design at St. St. Martin's for menswear. And I also was offered a place at Women's College of Fashion at Biochemistry. I did a cosmetic research degree there in the end. But I always wanted to do the fashion one too. Uh, if there was a way I could, could have done both, I would have done both. Because I love fashion. I'd love to do a fashion brand. But it's just, it's just like, I, I never think of things like, I can't do them. I just think it's the time and right to do it now. Am I doing mm. too many things at once? But I'd love to do a fashion brand. What exciting projects have you got in the pipeline that you can talk about? that you want to sort of plug? So I mentioned a couple of times during this uh, this convo that I've got a website called Agitprop and it's spelled like a git prop. And the reason I wanted to call it Agitprop was because I wanted to create a linked propaganda and from what I perceive as propaganda, I wanted to do the opposite. So we were being told there was a, an advert that was like, dairy is so good for your health. And there was like women like with milk fountains everywhere did you see this advert it was crazy it was like a national no advert. but all dairy did was make me fat <laughs> oh no stop it but i thought that was propaganda i thought that was a silly nhs thing i know people can get benefits from drinking milk if they think about it in, in like a perfect dairy cow from the swiss hills mm. but not in a factory farm cow for the sink and it's full of God knows what hormones and iceberg. I thought, okay, this is propaganda. We're being taught propaganda. And it goes through all trails of our life. So I wanted to do the opposite and I wanted to start doing a coffee table book. So in 2016, I started to work on a coffee table book that was about each page was an image that I thought was being shown in the media that was wrong. So I would do a makeup look or a concept behind it that would show the opposite. And it was all a, sort of like a precursor to doing my website. Um, the coffee table book idea, I brought it to a manager I was working with in 2015-16, and they mocked up my coffee table deal. So I didn't get to launch it as a book, even though I've got all the work for it done. I did all the photography and it's still there on my hard drive. Um, I'd like to do a renovated version that's to attached to my website, because now my website the hub of all things food, vegan food, travel diaries, um, blogs, wildflower diaries, environmentalism stuff. I want to combine the two because I want it to be like a happy place for people to find inspiration and find beautiful images. Just, they don't even make any sense on the stuff I post. It just makes me smile. And if, I think if I see a nice picture, it makes me psychologically calmer. I just mm. like doing things like that. I think it's really important. And it's important to see someone like me do that. So that's my big website. And I've got some amazing interviews coming. I have a few legends for those of myself coming, including Kate Bornstein, Ooh. Scientologist, superstar. She was in the Iron Kate series. Um, I also have James and James, who I mentioned in this video. I have Jimmy James, a legendary drag queen, Coco Peru, a legendary drag queen. I've got lots of awesome people, Danny Lismore, Dustio, a legendary drag queen. And then I've also got some really cool things where I've interviewed people that channel aliens. So I have like all different things, all manner of things. I've got a lady called Laura Harold, a man called Lee Harris, who's a big energy leader. I've got lots of different things. It's just like a fun exploration. So that's my big project, which I want you guys to check out. 
Apart from that, everything else is under Jojo Carlos. Um, but you can call me Jojo because that's how I know. Um, but yeah, lots of different stuff. And, and I've launched a few new companies in lockdown. So be sharing a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think, that's the best. Add your props up well. It's glam. It sounds great, honestly. <laughs> there's, so many di- there's so many things that you've got going on. And this coffee book, I wouldn't even put them all together. Sell separate ones. Sell loads. Well, I'd like to do an exhibit. I'd like to do like a proper exhibit, but I want new stuff in it. So yeah. if I could do, because I've got so many, I've got so much archive artwork that people have never seen. But when they say they're like, what the hell? This is amazing. Just you do this. Because people don't know I paint. They don't know I do the photo, photo stuff. And I'm just like, well, if I could put it all into an exhibit, but I, I want to do like it on a big level. Now I've done too much stuff. I want to do it on a big level. So maybe, maybe I'll ask my friend Daniel as much and see what he says, because he's done a Kate exhibit. But who knows? We should see. <laughs> we need a JoJo archive. <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, my God. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Jo. Honestly, thank you for having me. I'm so sorry my voice having you on board. All the conversations we've had, even from the start at the Share Your Story campaign. <laughs> so thank you so much for all your support. Thank you. Take care.